Greetings and welcome to another Insight Project video. Welcome. So, I thought this was going to be a two-part uh, series with this, you know, next-gen rotor design. Um, however, when I started to go through the prior art and the antecedents, I realized that's a video in itself. And then in the third part, I'll have fun playing in the Tinkercad sandbox and just put together the the rotors and then hopefully. You know, you got to enjoy the process, um, but hopefully within like a month uh, or so, month or two at the most, um, have some rotor spinning based on, on these ideas. And just to sort of recap, um, what I'm looking at is, you know, when I, again, I'm not an electrical engineer, don't have any background in this, but I'm just saying when I look at the conventional electric motor designs, you know, outrigger or, what, you know, whatever they are, they always just seem to make use of one end of the electromagnet. So the rotor is being driven by the changing magnetic flux and you're putting energy into the coil and you get a changing magnetic flux on this side, say north. But you also have a changing magnetic flux on the opposite side of south and that never gets made use of. And you know you can uh, think of ways to, to make use of that, especially if you have like the rotors going past north-south, north-south, or even if they were monopole, you could have a pickup coil and, you know, but they, they don't make use of this other end of the electromagnet. And at first glance, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it seems sort of like, you know, breathing with one lung or something. You're, you're missing out on half of the total magnetic flux that you bother to establish with current. So I don't know why that is, or there might be a very good reason for it. I, I don't really know. Um, so that's that's what I'm going to talk about here, and just go over some of the prior art and the antecedents to it. As I said, it turned into a into a whole video. Um, you know, you you might want to check out the um, the. The first video I did on this, so it's going to be three parts. You might want to check out the part one. Just astonishing video. <laughs> I'm being an ass. But um, I'm still trying to learn YouTube, and if I can, I'll put a link to it like over my shoulder here, and I'll put in a link at the end if I figure out how to do that. At the least, I'll, I'll put it in the, the video description. But I mean, to be honest, I just kind of explained it there. But you still want to, I definitely want to check out the the previous video actually I mean it does go into a little more depth so in this video we'll just talk about some other people who actually did make use of both ends of the magnet okay let's get to it so if we start with this page of notes from the inventor John Bedini then we see this device from from when he was working with Ron Cole I believe in the 1980s and what do we see we see this end of the coil doing work, we say this end of the coil doing work. Now there's a second difference also with this device and that here it's mentioned as a permanent magnet but um, I think it's more commonly um, notated as soft metal and that I'm not even going to worry about that right now but that would provide an alternate magnetic flux path that's similar to the stuff Thane Hines up in Canada has been doing with his bitoroidal transformer and so what you would expect with this is it might have some odd behavior if you put it under load and I don't I don't mean a physical load I mean if you were putting a magnetic pickup coil it might have some interesting behavior um, I'm not even going to worry about that now, but that would be something to look at in future. So this this Ron Cole John Bedini device has two differences, but the one I'm concerned about um, right now is, yeah, here's someone finally making use of both sides of the electromagnet, which would expect to be a benefit, and um, they reported this as a as a um, a good motor. So here we see. Uh, a replication of this motor by J.L. Nauden in 1996, the G-Field generator. And um, again, we see the same thing. Now, both sides of the coil are brought to bear, 
and you have this soft steel magnetic flux path between the air and the air. Now, Nodden didn't really see anything very special with it. <laughs> so, um, then uh, John Bedini had a number of comments uh, here, which um, I'm not going to go through them all, but he's saying, well, you know, I think you want to look at this, and you want to do this, and, uh, and then it might work a bit better. Here we see another picture of the G-Field generator. Which, uh, this is the highest quality I can find. But again, you see the coil here with both sides of the electromagnet now doing work. And I bring this up because um, they give some attribution here. Tom Be Beard and John Bedini, Ron Cole, and then they mention Cromray. I mean, they might have put his first name in there. Um, but that's Raymond Cromray. And he's actually a patented prior antecedent to this motor. So, I mean, I think this is basically just a Cromray motor that they're calling a G-Field generator. We'll take a look at the patent, um, and there, there may be some differences, but the Cromray generator is obviously very similar to this um, as they, they give some attribution there. So here is a diagram of the Cromray patent from his 1968 patent numbers there and what I would draw attention to is again someone's bringing both sides of the electromagnet to bear for once so this really isn't exactly the same as the G4 so he's got coils out there and there I don't know I mean I haven't studied the patent or exactly what's going on but what I'm interested in looking at is just bringing both sides of the coil to bear if we go to the write-up on his patent, I won't spend too much time here, but I would just highlight that um, he does mention a pair of diametrically extending air gaps for establishing a magnetic flux path. So I don't think I was completely insane saying that they connected those two ends there to have an additional magnetic flux path. Um, but let's move on from here. So it started with um, Cromray and then um, uh, uh, Bedini, Beard, and Ron Cole. And then there's another I'll share with you. Rick Friedrich is another gentleman that worked with John Bedini, though after a number of years they had a bitter and drama-filled falling out. And I don't want to uh, chime into a three-ring circus, especially when I know absolutely nothing about it. Um, but I believe that Rick is still involved with this um, this company, um, although that may not be the case, but in the type of motor I'll show you, I know he's got videos um, talking about that sort of motor. So let's go down here and this motor. And look at the picture there. So you can see again, both sides of the electromagnet are now doing work against a rotor there and a rotor up there. I don't know why he's calling it four pole. It looks like eight magnets. I would like to call it eight or sixteen pole, but maybe I don't understand the meaning of the word. Um, but in any event, uh, let's go back and here's like another one he's got. This one He's, he's stacked it in two layers. That might even give another benefit that if this is pulsing north, driving that, if there was any inductance going to this coil, it would be generating the south, which is what you would want from here. So this one might even be uh, an even further benefit. I don't know. But if we go back to the other one, so if they say that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, I intend to compliment the shit out of Rick because I'm going to try and build something very, very similar to this. Um, I might not have quite as many magnets and I also want to make it a little bit more adjustable because you could, you know, um, this is radial flux right now. You could also turn these coils on their sides and have an axial flux similar to a window motor. And lastly, um, to take an idea from Robert Murray Smith uh, would be a serpentine coil which I'm very excited about trying out because that I, I, it, I don't see why that wouldn't work really really well 
and it would also make the um, the tedium of winding coils just down to a minimum. It would be so much easier to wind coils that way, and I think it I think it might even be a better way. There's there's one thing I can already think of that you could do with a serpentine coil. You couldn't do with something like this or with um, having it set up axial flux style. So looking forward to complimenting Robert Murray Smith as well. So let's stop with this and head over to Tinkercad and just start start tinkering and uh, and designing this.